When you're a writer on a design or a product team, you need all the inspiration you can get. Scott Kuby can help you. His book, Writing for Designers, sets out a simple, sensible path to get writing work done. He also has plenty of pragmatic advice to help word people collaborate effectively with their design and technical colleagues. But the most significant insight you may take away from this interview is Scott's relentless focus on his source of inspiration, his users and customers. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. We talk with professionals who work across the span of content strategy, from small businesses to big enterprises, from content design to content marketing, from solo consultancies to huge agencies. Our mission is to democratize content strategy to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 73 of the Content Strategy Insights podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Scott Kuby. Uh, Scott is the author of Writing for Designers. And um, well, that's how he's best known. He's known for a lot of things. But that's what I wanted to talk to him about <laughs> today about is writing for designers. Uh, so tell the folks a little bit more about your background, Scott, and welcome to the show. And, and, uh, and uh, tell us how you got to, to the point of writing that book. Sure. Thanks, Larry. Very happy to be here today. Uh, yeah, so my book is sort of the distillation of um, most specifically a work experience I had at a company called Wolfram Research, uh, where I had come on as uh, initially, I think the job title was user interface writer. And they were um, a few years uh, ahead of the curve in this case, uh, they recognizing a problem that a lot of organizations have now, which is that they have tons of UX designers working on all kinds of different products. And those products uh, are not just mere flows and interface components, but they all contain a lot of words. And depending on the competency, confidence, uh, training, what have you, with, with words and language that uh, folks have in an organization, that is either a, a just totally fine thing or it's a real bumpy ride. Uh, and I was brought on because they, they were having a bumpy ride. That, um, so I sort of got... Uh, field training in sort of just talking about words and language to uh, UX designers, to folks that have sort of a product and UX mindset about content and about language and about words and just, you know, slotted in my background, which, you know, varies across uh, communications, uh, information architecture, some UX design work, um, and, and took it from there. And so it's, it's something that I've gotten uh, I felt I had a, a certain knack for of not only of just doing that work, but of talking to people about it and kind of advocating for the role of content in a UX design process. And so that's what I've really been been focused on for the last many years now. Got it. So you, you were most recently at Brain Traffic. And how long ago was the Wolfram gig? That was, um, that was maybe longer. So that's a... For brain traffic, brain traffic, I did freelance for about a year and a half. Um, so that was, you know, what it was, four, five, six, seven, eight years ago now, somewhere okay. in there. So still kind of early in the, because I think the term UX writer has only been really common in the last, what, two or three years, I think. Um, and, and I think a lot of people think of a UX writer as like a UI writer, that like the most of that job is writing that UI copy and maybe onboarding scripts and, and, and um, some other stuff, but, but mostly about UI. Um, did that remain the scope of the job in your tenure at Wolfram or did? No, no, it sure didn't. Yeah. They, um, you know, I kind of advocated early on, uh, cause we did not have the UX writer term. Uh, and I went with content strategist. Uh, so we, you know, that got mixed into the job title at some point and then, you know, it sort of inverted to where content strategy came first. And I think, uh, you know, maybe a copywriter was at the end or something. Um, and, and one of the, the sort of the tug of war there around the job titles, um, is, is something I've heard from a lot of other folks, which is that organizations are, um, reticent sometimes to let go of count for writers because they know there's such a persistent need for content. Um, and I think that um, in individual careers, something that, that I experienced, a lot of other folks I talk to experience, um, that, that some writers, writers like me, are very interested in the product. They want to get more and more involved in the product and the design side of things. Uh, and sometimes the business wants to keep someone with a writing talent um, 
less focused so that they can, you know, potentially apply them to like marketing campaigns or informational website content or things that that person uh, might not find themselves writing if they were, you know, only part of a, a product or design team. Um, so yeah, so content strategy came in the mix there, um, you know, and then at, at Brain Traffic, content strategy consultants are working on big web projects with all kinds of big organizations, um, health insurance, finance, uh, universities, and so on, and worked with all kinds of different writing teams there and found that, you know, out in the world, the, the job titles, I mean, who knows? <laughs> well, Everybody, everybody's called everything, you know, um, content design. Uh, at one organization basically means UX writing or even product design. Content design at another organization basically means writing for websites. Uh, so it's, it's all over the place out there. And, and I just, and broadly, me, I just am trying to help people who are, are interested in, in better content for their users, whatever the context. Yeah, well, there is an interesting um, dynamic unfolding here. You know, because like you're saying, companies get that they need a writer and they keep you around and whatever they call you doesn't really matter. They use you in the moment. But there's also like us as a discipline trying to articulate what we do and how we can help people and how we can slot in. And that's a really seems like a pretty awkward fit at this point. Um, you know, for one of the examples I always think of is like if you look line by line at the description for a UX writer at Google and a content strategist at Facebook, it's identical. <laughs> for sure. It's almost yeah. identical. And um, do, have you seen have you seen that getting codified at all? Or do you see or how would you like to see it codified? Maybe that's a better. Question. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, <laughs> if, if you know, if, uh, if, if if the industry wants to hand me the magic wand, I, you know, I have opinions. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, titles aside, the most important thing to me is that if you're in uh, if you're part of a product team, if you're part of a design team, I think that it's important intellectually, personally, philosophically to think of yourself as a designer. Uh, and if your job title is still UX writer, if it's content specialist, if it is information architect, whatever it might be, that's fine. Uh, even content strategist. Those are... Uh, you know, th that title is just speaking to sort of a specialization or a focus on words and language and meaning, but you are still part of the design team. And that is, that's the most important thing. Um, so within that framework, um, what tends to, what makes the most sense to me, just, you know, painting with a broad brush across all the, the folks and organizations I've talked to, um, I like UX writer for a member of a design team that's focused on interface copy and concepts and labels. Um, I like, and I've gotten more pushback on this one, um, but I like content designer um, as sort of an elevated idea of writer. So in a lot of big companies that I've worked with, um, especially through my time at Brain Traffic, there are whole content design programs at institutions that don't have any UX to speak of, or if they do have UX, um, UX is, is kind of a baby discipline there. And a lot of times it sort of means like, you know, the young people who are good with the, like with running the Adobe Experience Manager and optimizing our landing pages. Um, and no, you know, nothing against the folks in those roles, but just like that's as extensive as an idea of, ex as extensive of an idea as UX is at a lot of organizations. And you can have that small of an idea of UX and still have a huge content design program. Um, and the ones I've encountered and where it works well and makes sense to me is that um, identifying as a content designer, thinking about co it being as content design and not just writing, um, ends up opening a lot of eyes. And it opens organizations up to working on content in different ways. Uh, and it's a, it's a very liberating idea and title. So I sort of like content design. I've described it often as a method of writing. Uh, folks will tell me, well, no, I don't just write. I do this and I do that and I do this other thing. And I say, well, great, because you're part of a design team. Uh, you know, if you are wireframing things, that doesn't mean that wireframing is part of content design. To me, that just means that you are stepping into a more traditional interface design role. Uh, if you build the information architecture, great. You are stepping into an information architecture role. Uh, for me, content design is a sort of an elevated form of uh, writing. UX writing is very app and interface specific. 
Right. That's so interesting. I love the way you put that because so many writers, when they get promoted, it's to content strategist. And that's like the most meaningless term, I think, in many cases, because it's just like, well, we know they're doing more than writing, but so let's give them a different title. But I think you articulate it better, like that specific role in a UX context. It's funny, just yesterday, I was listening to Jared Spool talk about um, UX maturity, you know, practice maturity in organizations. And Mm -hmm. it seems like there's something analogous in organizations as to their kind of content, not just content strategy, but content strategy, UX writing, content design, whatever you call it, it's sort of integration and the maturity of practice among each, like, cause like you're saying nothing against the, the people executing marketing content, but there's a difference between that and like getting up to enterprise information architecture or, or a company wide content strategy. Um, I guess putting you back in the um, the you're the guy representing the discipline of of, of whatever we are <laughs> uh, and and articulating that. How would you? Um, I guess what's your optimal uh, situation for content in an organization? Like, what would be the best manifestation of? Because there's a lot more that happens besides the UX writing and the content design. There is that other stuff you mentioned, like the informational and marketing content on the website. There's tech support stuff. There's there's sales scripts and all this other stuff that's out there. Um, have you seen, or do you have in your head a model of like the best way to do that as sort of an integrative practice in an organization? Well, since you invoked uh, Jared Spool, I will invoke the Jared Spoolism of it depends. Uh, it, that I think that model uh, <laughs> really varies, right? The ideal model really varies. Um, it is rare that I've seen that uh, one approach works across an entire enterprise, you know? So there's um, like a, when we're setting up content uh, workflows and governance, when I was doing that kind of work at brain traffic, um, you know, there's sort of like a fundamental question at, how, at your content operations planning, which is, are you going to be um, most distributed or centralized? Um, which, you know, and there's a lot of version variations within those, but um, some organizations go the route of having, say, a content center of excellence or having some kind of like uh, kind of an agency model, you know, where you mm-hmm. bring us content requests and then we uh, find the right person to work on it and they solve your problem and then they're on to the next one. And maybe they're doing four or five of those things at a time. Um, Jonathan Coleman recently has been really pushing this idea of like, apparently they destroyed content design, whatever that means. And, and which my understanding of it is, is it's just that uh, they got rid of the distributed model and they embedded the content designers. Great, I'm glad that, that embedding content designers uh, or UX writers or whatever it might be works for, for different organizations. Um, so I, I don't think there is an ideal model. I think that, um, you know, putting on my content strategist hat for a minute, the ideal model for me is one that is well documented and well socialized. And that's very often what is missing is the actual articulation, the writing down of and sharing out of what our model is and how it works. You know, who is assigned to what, what are their actual roles and responsibilities and so on. Um, And that, uh, the idea of like a roles and responsibilities matrix, you know, in the book I talk about the idea of embodying the role of the writer, Mm -hmm. irrespective of job title. Um, I think roles are something we don't talk about enough in design and in design work. Articulating those roles to me is more important and is what people need to do to get a piece of work done together. And that's a lot more important than like how the org chart looks. Right. And to what you've said, uh, everything to this point, that, that when you put together, like if a product is coming together, you got a team and you just sort of look like, okay, we got to get words from someplace. We have to get pictures from someplace. We have to have um, wireframes or however we organize things and all that from someplace. What do you got? What do you got? Is, is that's, do you picture it as sort of a, not ad hoc, but sort of a, a pragmatic approach to, to team roles and responsibilities? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, I often, you know, when I, if I'm doing this in like a, a training context, I'll kind of um, remind people, you know, like if you were planning, if, if you all just came together to plan a party, um, you're like, and maybe you're even doing that in the context of work, uh, your, your job titles are, don't have much, don't have anything to do with planning a party. They don't tell you anything useful. So you're all going to have to sit down and figure out who's, uh, who's picking up the cake, who's paying for the cake, like who's ordering streamers, who's going to keep this person busy so that we can surprise them, everything else. Um, and I think that we, uh, we being designers broadly, um, often assume 
that we already know how a thing works or how a piece of work should be done based on those job titles, and that ends up being not very productive. Um, I, I think if you were to have a conversation as a team of who's going to be doing what, and it ended up perfectly mirroring your org chart and the responsibilities were already reflected in someone's job description, I'd be very surprised by that, uh, but I would say congratulations. You have excellent job descriptions and job titles. Uh, I've never found that to be the case. When I go in um, and consult with a team, the org chart tells me nothing. The job titles tell me nothing. I have to talk to people to understand what they do. Right. And a lot of what you just said reminds me that a truism that emerges over and over again in my interviews is that people make up about 90% of content strategy practice, <laughs> that it's mostly about that, like aligning stakeholders, about figuring out workflows, about figuring out who needs to do what, um, that it's mostly a people enterprise. Yeah. I think that's yeah. true even of UX writing, which is a much more applied, at, you know, UX writing is a, is a much more design flavored version of the kind of work that, that, that we do and the, the people on this podcast do. Um, it's, it's got a very heavy design flavor to it. It's applied. You're like in the wireframes, you're in Figma, you're editing and changing things. You know, you're, you're really doing stuff as part of the product. Uh, that's still 20, 25% of the work. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the rest of it is about collaboration and being part of a product team. And that's the thing that I'm coaching junior UX writers on all the time um, is to, to show in their portfolio, to talk about out loud, to focus on from a skill development perspective uh, is understanding just how does good design work happen and how can you best contribute to that? Uh, that to me is a lot more interesting conversation than, for instance, like what is good UX writing or what are the uh, best practices in UX writing. Uh, I think it's better to arrive at those kinds of ideas through collaborative work with your team, right? Making design decisions as part of a design process and not trying to turn yourself into some sort of, you know, rule and best practice quoting UX writing robot um, who's not going to be a very fun person to work with, I wouldn't think. No, that's right. I think, I think that's the thing that comes up over and over again, too, is the, uh, these are all creative professions and stitching together creatives to make a business product can be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, my, uh, someone asked me this morning in a, in a conversation about like, you know, what inspires or motivates my work. Um, and I, an easy answer for that one that I will use until my retirement, I imagine, um, which is just users. I, I think users and what users need is the point where we all come together. Uh, and I like to work outward from that as opposed to, you know, trying to work some sort of ideal plan of like how, you know, what the right model is or how these teams should be structured. You know, it's, to me, it seems, I'd be honestly skeptical that at a big company, I mean, you look at a Facebook or a Google, so many different kinds of products. Is, is it really make sense that like there's one model for how, the words get written that's going to work for every single one of those products. You know, I've, I've got recruiters from Google talking to me about jobs in VR, uh, doing AI, doing machine learning things, doing web content, doing support content. That's all very different stuff. And to think that that all needs to get written in the same way with the same workflows and roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. stretches credulity for me. I, I don't find that plausible. Well, it's interesting that that list of potential applications of UX writing skills that you just uh, listed. Um, there's, there's this, and I don't, I'm just gonna try to do this kindly and gently, but, but there's this perception among other design and business professionals, oh, you're just the writer. You just put the words in there, do, you know, do this thing that we need to do, then it needs some words. Um, that's, I think that drives everybody nuts in our yeah. profession. And um, I'm wondering, you've seen that dynamic obviously more than once. Um, do you have any, um, I guess, and I think a lot of people have str not struggled isn't the right word, but like, it seems like we're constantly tr having to try to um, reinforce the people the importance of content and how it fits in. Do you have any success stories about places where you've gone in where there was some of that skepticism or, or um, dismissiveness almost, and where you came kind of came in and said, nope, I'm, the, I'm a really valuable content person. Here's how this, uh, here's how this can help you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly I, so you're absolutely right. I hear this from people all the time. Uh, I think that, you know, there, there does seem to be that attitude out there. Um, I'll tell you, I, maybe it's just the kind of weird position I sit in as someone who's written a book in this space, who ends up talking 
sort of more to the writers and to the designers than I, than I on any given day, than maybe I am out in, uh, you know, being in an in-house role. Um, I hear this a lot from writers. I hear this a lot from word people of like, you know, like if you, if you kind of listen very carefully to the framing, it's like, I'm not just the writer. Well, what's wrong with being the writer? Like who decided that writing was a, a bad word? Who decided that writing was a small idea? Who decided that words, you know, it's not, I don't just do words. Well, geez, if you did, you could, plenty of people just do words and, and, and make a pretty penny out of it and, and create beautiful experiences with them. Um, so all that said, uh, I find that my typical approach to this is to um, help folks understand how the words connect to um, bigger, even bigger ideas, like just the conceptual framework that the product operates in, um, that the words are derived from this thing that we have called information architecture. And you have an information architecture, whether you designed it or not, that's a thing that just exists. Uh, and, you know, the conceptual clarity and all these things that I, I, you know, so I'm talking a lot about clarity, about concepts, about continuity, consistency, all these things that exist at the micro level with UX writing and microcopy, but they exist at the macro level too. Um, and so I do a lot of Diagramming, visualizations, I make little charts, I make pictures, um, I make maps to kind of show people that these, um, that these choices are not coming from my uh, love of grammar or the AP style book. I could give two hoots and I need an editor to, to fix that stuff for me anyway, because I don't know, I, I, I can't diagram a sentence. I'm not entirely clear what the uh, gerund is. <laughs> you know, I like, I, it's, that's not my relationship to words. I uh, relate to them as concepts and, and that and selling that on the bigger picture, um, people know that there's problems there because that's hard stuff to talk about. And if you can be the person that helps them start to see some of those invisible things that power their product, like the information architecture, the taxonomy, the concepts, the messaging, um, they will understand that you are a very valuable member of the team. That's right. And what you just said there, it goes right back to the collaboration because that a lot of like the messaging, you're probably talking to the branding folks and the marketing folks and the information architecture, maybe talking to the more technically inclined folks on the team. And so that, that ability, I think that's something that some, like some people, a lot of people are coming to UX writing, for example, from journalism or, or poetry or other places like that. And um, they are really good at the word part, but maybe lacking a little bit in that, um, that, that kind of big picture that you just described of like you're inheriting things from the information architecture or from the, um, uh, from the messaging architecture. Have you, because you, kind of, I kind of picture you as like a coach about this. Uh, that, that seems to be like, if I had to summarize you in one word for somebody asking about what kind of UX writer is Scott. Um, so have you coached people through that? Or, or, and you mentioned that you're doing some mentoring and stuff now, like helping people get that, um, that kind of grounding in the whole product and design ecosystem? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I, especially when I was um, in that role at Wolf and supporting so many different designers, uh, somewhat by necessity, but, but also by slight preference, um, I would rather just personally help a designer um, understand the flow of the design and the challenge and the user need clearly enough for them to make the right word choice than for me to write it for them. Um, and it is a lot of uh, what, what I tend to do, um, and th this is a little abstract, I realize, but like very often we get, at the time someone is stuck on the words, they've gotten down to a very deep level and they're looking they're not even looking at the whole screen sometimes. They're like, they're staring at the button and like, what do I make the button say? And a lot of times all I really need to do as a, as a coach or a guide in that situation is to just ask what se seemingly very obvious questions about like, well, what, like what's around the button? Like, is someone gonna confuse this with the, like, it looks like there's another link up here. So this link does something different than the button does. Uh, so let's have that, let's hold that in our heads. Maybe write that down. And then think about how is the button different than what the link does? Well, it's different in this way. Okay. Well, we probably need to get one of those, like what you just said to me, we probably want to get one of those words onto the button because that's going to be really important for people to understand the difference between these two things. Uh, now, where does the button go? Well, the button takes them here. Okay. You know, so you ask someone to explain where the button goes. 
It's like, okay, well, we probably want to get one of those words in there so that they understand where it's going. So we need, a, we need the word that helps us understand that it's different from this. We need the word that helps them understand where it's going. Now, if, you, now if you've got those two words, um, what should it say? You know, what do you think it should say? And at that point, it usually writes itself. Um, and and that, that kind of componentized uh, like, uh, approach to writing, to me, like, doesn't feel a lot like writing. Like, that's not how I write my blog posts. That's not how I write in my diary. Like, that is, that is deriving the answer from the context and the framework of the thing you're designing. And depending on what kind of problem they're stuck on, I might pull them all the way up to like, what kind of product is this? And how is it different from other products that are like it? You know, if, if we're up at, at the marketing or conceptual level. Um, so yeah, so sometimes it's, it's facilitation um, of, of, uh, in just one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's doing that as a workshop. Uh, I'll make diagrams or ecosystem maps, um, which you and I talked about previously uh, mm -hmm. offline, you know, of, of sort of like helping people visualize the world that their uh, content and their app lives in and just really whatever it takes to get the job done. Yeah. I guess I, kind of, I almost want to take you to task a little bit because what you just described is a really good practice to do. And you're like, well, this isn't so much about best practices as it is about collaboration. But you just outlined a really good approach, I think, to problem solving a word situation. Yeah, well, you know, so uh, the, I, what I find in the literature, such as it is, of blog posts on Medium about UX writing right now um, is a lot of things that people describe as best practices are really more like, potential principles you could adopt to guide some of your word choices, um, but they're not as rooted in practice. Um, and I think that's where our discipline has a lot of growing to do, is sort of articulating the best practices in, from a process perspective, you know, of the best practice of being the UX writer, not the best, quote unquote, best practice of you know, using this kind of tone in this kind of situation or like always being concise. You know, everyone's like, oh, you, you always have to be concise. I'm like, well, you, you don't always have to be concise. Like most of the time you should be concise. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want to be incredibly verbose. Uh, and that's a choice that you should make contextually. Uh, so if the best practice is choose words contextually, then, you know, that's when I'll co-sign. Yep. No, and that, I love the way you said it because I think that's like I'm I'm old and I go back to that era when Strunk and White was God and the Chicago style manual. You just did what they said. I think we're in an era where there's um, that's just not productive and it doesn't help yeah. anybody to be prescriptive and a grammar nerd about stuff. It's um, that's right. I, anyhow, I, that that's like a, a, an aside that I think. Um, but I think it gets to that point of like, it's more about collaboration, like doing what the team needs to do. And if your language, uh, and, you, and, you, and you can't come in as the writer with this prescribed way of doing things, that, that it's more like an approach that you're describing than a practice maybe. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that you invoke Strunk and White and that we can't quite, you know, it's hard to do it that way anymore. Um, my experience, you know, content strategist, if, if it's, if you're legitimately doing it the way that you and I understand content strategy, like that's not a junior level job, um, which means that I'll politely phrase it as say, most content strategists are not very young people. Uh, and I think that the instinct there is often to like, well, what I need to do is take all of these uh, grammar rules that, that I know, but other people don't know, and I'm going to customize them for our digital environment. And so then you get voice and tone guidelines, and you get style guides, and you get this, this production of more rules. And no one likes that. Like, that's not a fun way to work, is to feel like you're being given rules. Um, the best iterations of style guides and, and of help that a content strategist can provide, uh, I think is more in the form of a tool, right? If you, could, you give somebody a rule, you can give them a tool. You give them a tool to me is anything that like helps people think or work through a problem. So meeting agendas, worksheets, uh, tips, checklists, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Because um, you can't just give people a bunch of rules and expect that they're suddenly going to know how to write. Um, because if that was the case, they would already be good writers because that's how they try to teach us writing in school. Uh, and that clearly didn't stick the first time. So I don't think it's going to stick the second time. Right. And we can't go back upstream and fix college <laughs> curricula. So anyway, yeah. Sadly, no, yeah. No. Hey, Scott, we're coming up on time. I noticed these always go so quickly. I, wanna, okay. I, just, I like, always like to make sure if there's anything last, anything that has, that has come up in the conversation that you want to follow up on or, or just that's on your mind about content strategy or UX writing in general, um, anything last you want to share with the folks? 
Yeah, you know, I would just love to to encourage anyone out there if you uh, if you love words and you love writing and you want to be part of a uh, design process or you already are part of a design process and you're feeling that that fear or that concern that that Larry evoked that you know that maybe um, you're not valued or your work isn't valuable. Um, it, I know it's hard to articulate it sometimes, but the fact that it's hard to articulate doesn't mean that you're not valuable. Uh, you're, you are a good designer. Uh, you do not have to be an expert at operating Figma or Axure or InDesign or XD to be a good designer. Um, if you, you know, I would encourage you to think about the, the biggest level of design, which is just conceiving of the product and, and inventing these worlds that our products and teams operate in. Um, a lot of the folks coming up with that kind of stuff, they're not interaction designers. Um, they are big pick thinkers and they're word and meaning and language people like you. Um, so I'm not really like a pep talk guy, but that was my version of it. I believe in you. You can do good design. Uh, that's, that's a message I'd like to leave people with. That's great. I love that. And I think we're all kind of making that you know, baby steps towards that thinking of ourselves differently than not just the writer, but like, no, we're a designer having to work with words in this case. And there you go. Hey, one last thing, Scott, um, what's the yeah. best place for people to stay in touch, uh, follow you on social media or connect? Um... Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, especially in this uh, lockdown living world that we're in, I'm, I'm online all the time. You can reach me anywhere. Uh, it's, it's all centralized on my website, um, which is kubi, K-U-B-I-E dot C-O, kubi dot co. It's not dot com. I don't have the dot com missed that boat. Uh, but if you go to kubi.co, that's got uh, LinkedIn. Happy to connect with people there. Twitter is always a great place um, and, and newsletters and such that folks can sign up for. Great. Oh, that's right. Because you do, I do want to make sure because you do a UX writing events newsletter. Do you do other stuff like that? Um, it's all on your website, but I just want to make yeah. sure people know about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I've got a couple of projects in the works. Um, I have a, just a very personal newsletter. It's not about content that I send. Um, I aim to send monthly. That doesn't always happen. Um, but I would love more subscribers there. Um, and if anyone out there is a content, uh, would think of themselves as a content manager or a content leader in their organization, um, we don't need more consultants. I got we got communities for those folks. But if you're in-house and you're trying to lead a content team, um, I'm working on a project to try and bring some of those folks together. So I'd be especially interested in hearing from you. Oh, great. Okay, cool. And your, your website is the one-stop shopping. You got it. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Really enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely, Larry. This is really fun. I appreciate you doing this. I think 70 plus episodes of anything is impressive, let alone uh, keeping the uh, fire going about content and UX writing and all the rest. So we, uh, we all really appreciate it. Thanks. You bet. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.